Imagine for the moment that I asked you to determine how much heat was required to increase the temperature of 350 milliliters of water from 68 degrees Celsius to 90 degrees Celsius. Well, the way that we would set this up would be to establish a system. I could define my system as the mass of the water. I could probably get away with assuming that the change in mass is negligibly small, at which point I would have heat entering my system and increasing the temperature. And if I were to make some sweeping assumptions like mm, the density of our water doesn't change, therefore as the temperature changes the volume doesn't change, there's no work opportunities, and if I were to neglect any heat transfer in the outward direction and just call it Q in, the thing that I'm solving for, and if I were to neglect any changes in kinetic potential energy, my energy balance would simplify down to Q in is equal to mass, which if I assumed was constant, I could factor out times U2 minus U1. The mass we could determine because we know the volume and we can look up the density of water at 68 or 90 degrees Celsius. So the question really becomes, how do we determine delta U? And for that, we have a couple of different options. The one that we know already is going to be the best option. So I'm going to call this options for evaluating delta U and delta H. Option one is to look them up and subtract them. And this is what we've done so far. We have two state points. One is at 68 degrees Celsius, the other is at 90 degrees Celsius. We could presumably look up an internal energy. The problem with that is we don't actually have enough information to perform the lookup properly. We don't know another independent intensive property which would be required to fix the state. We just have a temperature. So we could probably get away with, here, let me start a new page. We could probably get away with assuming something. I mean, if we were to assume, say, that the pressure was, I don't know, let's call it uh, 100 kilopascals, that's, that's basically one atmosphere, right? I mean, it's close enough, I would say. We have a temperature at state 1, then, of 68 degrees Celsius, and a pressure at state 1 of, oh, about 100 kilopascals. Okay, with that information assumed, I can look up E1. All I would have to do there is find the intersection of 68 degrees Celsius and 100 kilopascals in my tables. And that process is going to begin by determining the phase at state 1, which I could do by looking up the saturation temperature corresponding to my pressure and comparing my temperature to that, or I can look up the saturation pressure corresponding to my temperature and compare my pressure to that. In this case, I will look up the saturation temperature corresponding to 100 kilopascals and compare 68 to that temperature. The saturation temperature at 100 kilopascals is going to be Tsat at one bar, which if I jump into our tables, is going to be 99.63 degrees Celsius. My temperature at state 1 is less than 99.63 degrees Celsius, therefore it must be a compressed liquid. So if I peruse my compressed liquid tables, surely I will find a pressure subtable corresponding to one bar and... Oh, alas, I don't have one. I mean, I have a pressure subtable corresponding to 25 bar and 50 bar and 75 bar, but not one bar. Which means the bestest way to get a property here would be to interpolate. To interpolate between 25 bar and our saturation condition. Because remember, this is all describing water, our compressed liquid tables and our saturated liquid vapor mixture tables. We're just splitting them into phases. So the saturation condition, that is the saturated liquid property at 68 degrees Celsius, is going to be on one side of my data point, and the property at 25 bar and 68 degrees Celsius is going to be on the other side of my data point. So my interpolation would just be something like our pressure, which is one bar, minus PSAT at 68 degrees Celsius, divided by our pressure on the lowest subtable, which is 25 bar minus PSAT at 68 degrees Celsius. That proportion then would be applied for linear interpolation to the proportion of the way we are between those internal energies. So 
U1 minus UF at 68 degrees Celsius divided by U at 25 bar, 68 degrees Celsius minus UF at 68 degrees Celsius. Well, I know one, I know 25, but I don't know anything else. So we go into our tables. First, let's try to find the saturation pressure corresponding to 68 degrees Celsius. Well, if I jump back into our saturation tables, I want the one ordered by temperature. And if I find 68 degrees Celsius, I can see that the saturation pressure is, oh man, I don't happen to have a row for 68 degrees Celsius. So I have to interpolate. So that linear interpolation is going to be 68. Not what I wanted. Let's try that again. 68 minus 65 divided by 70 minus 65, the proportion of the way we are between 65 and 70. And we're saying that proportion is the same as the proportion of the way we are between the pressures. So x minus 0 0.2503 divided by 0 0.3119 minus 0 0.2503. And we are solving that relationship for x. We get 0 0.287. So we're saying that the saturation pressure at 68 degrees Celsius is about 0 0.287 to 6 bar. 0 0.287 to 6 bar. I mean, approximately, because we used linear interpolation. Then U at 25 bar and 68 degrees Celsius, surely that's just going to be an easy lookup in my compressed liquid tables. If I jump back to our compressed liquid tables, I can see that at 25 bar, I have a nice row for 68 degrees Celsius. Oh man, I don't. <sighs> so, interpolation number two, coming on up. We are going to take 68 minus 40 divided by 80 minus 40 is equal to the internal energy at 68 degrees Celsius, which I'm calling X for now, minus the internal energy at 25 bar and 40 degrees Celsius, 167.25, divided by the internal energy at 80 degrees Celsius and 25 bar, which is 334.29, minus the internal energy at 40 degrees Celsius and 25 bar, which is 167.25. And I get a value of 284.178. Two hundred eighty-four point one seven eight. Okay. So we are two thirds of the way through these intermediate stepping stone properties. The third one then is going to be UF at sixty-eight degrees Celsius. I'm sure that'll be a nice lookup, and not at all an interpolation. If we jump back to our saturation tables, this would be temperature again. And I find 68 degrees Celsius, and I look for UF at 68 degrees Celsius, and I see that we still don't have a row corresponding to 68 degrees Celsius in our saturation tables. So I'm going to be using the same temperature proportion to interpolate that I used for the pressure. So this is going to be 68 minus 65 divided by 70 minus 65. And that's equal to the thing that I'm looking for, minus 272.02, divided by 292.95, minus 272.02. And I get 284.578. Okay. 284.578 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, now that I've done those three interpolations, I can actually get to U1. And I get, here we go, 1 minus 0 0.28726 divided by 25 minus 0 0.28726. And then I'm taking that equal to x minus 284.578 divided by 284.178 minus 284.578. And we get 284.566. Okay, so U1 is about 284.566 kilojoules per kilogram. Cool. One interpolation done. For the next one, I'm going to be taking the condition at, I believe it was 90 degrees Celsius. Yeah, 90 and we're assuming it's still 100 kilopascals, about. 
So T2 is 90 degrees Celsius, and P2 is about one bar still, 100 kilopascals. So U2 then, going to be coming from our compressed liquid tables, because it still has not yet reached the saturation temperature, therefore it must be in the compressed liquid region. So I'm going to have to set up the same interpolation that I did last time, this time using one bar minus PSAT at 90 degrees Celsius, divided by 25 bar minus PSAT at 90 degrees Celsius. And I'm saying that's equal to U2 minus UF at 90 divided by the internal energy at 90 degrees Celsius and 25 bar minus UF at 90 degrees Celsius. In this interpolation, I know 1, I know 25. PSAT at 90 I can get from my saturation tables. If I jump over to the saturation tables by temperature, Scroll on down to 90. Fortunately for me, I have a pressure. It is 0 0.7014. So I can populate that. 0 0.7014 bar. Then the internal energy at 90 and 25 bar is going to come from our compressed liquid tables. 25 bar and 90 degrees Celsius. Man, I don't have a row for that either, so we're going to have to interpolate again. That's going to be 90 minus 80 divided by 100 minus 80, and that proportion is equal to our internal energy, which is what we're looking for, minus the value at 80, 334.29, divided by the value at 100, which is 418.24, minus the value at 80, which is 334.29, and with that, I can finally get this number, 376.265. And I can populate that, 376.265 kilojoules per kilogram. All I need now is UF at 90 degrees Celsius. So I'll go back to my tables, navigate by temperature, find 90 degrees Celsius, Thank fortune that I should have a row for 90, and I have 376.85, 376.85. And with that, I can perform the interpolation. So, if I set up another interpolation here, this is 1 minus 0 0.7014, divided by 25 minus 0 0.7014, and I'm setting that equal to the value that we're looking for minus 376.85 divided by 376.265 minus 376.85, and I get a value of 376.843. So my delta U with option one is u2 minus u1, which is going to be 376.843 minus 284.566, and we get 92.277 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay. We got an answer. How confident are we in that answer? Well, I'm pretty confident in our math. I mean, we did like 10 interpolations, but I'm confident that we did them correctly. But think about the assumptions that we made to get to that number. We assumed a pressure. We assumed that the pressure was the same. We assumed that we could use linear interpolation to approximate the values. That means that we have an uncertainty in our result. And that uncertainty may or may not be relevant to what we're doing. Depending on what we're doing with this number, we might need a more accurate number. For example, if we were talking about how much energy was required to pasteurize milk, that is a very precise temperature that we're trying to hit. We would probably want to be accurate. But the fact that this problem statement didn't give me much information implies that the precision of the result isn't super important. I mean, 
plus or minus a couple of percent is probably acceptable error. So, since we're already approximating by assuming a pressure and using linear interpolation, it might be okay if we assume just a little bit more error in order to get a result that's close enough. So the first approximation method that we will use is saying that when we're in the compressed liquid region, comma, and below the lowest pressure subtable, we can probably get away with assuming that our properties are basically the same as the saturated liquid property at that temperature. So essentially what we're doing here is neglecting the effects of pressure within the compressed liquid region close to the saturated liquid line. And that logic is based on the observation that pressure doesn't have nearly as much effect on the properties in the compressed liquid region as does the temperature. I mean, if we jump over into our compressed liquid tables and get rid of the calculator for a second, if I were to compare the internal energy at 25 bar and 80 degrees Celsius to the internal energy at 50 bar, which is twice the pressure, and 80 degrees Celsius, they change by what? A third of a percent? Maybe? Actually less than that. Half of a third of a percent? Like a sixth of a percent? But if we compare 25 bar and 80 degrees Celsius to 25 bar and 100 degrees Celsius, which is a proportion of temperature change that I can't do in my head, I mean, let's actually try that out. 100 plus 273.15 divided by 80 plus 273.15. That's a difference of 5%, changing the temperature 5% instead of doubling the pressure. We are affecting the internal energy way more. I mean, that's a difference of like 80 kilojoules per kilogram. So much more substantial is the temperature's effect on an internal energy than the pressure's that we assume that the pressure has no effect. That's the simplification that we are making in this shortcut. And when we apply this shortcut, then all we have to do to come up with delta U here is to say U1 is, oh, about the same as UF at 68 degrees Celsius, and U2 is about the same as UF at 90 degrees Celsius. So UF at those two temperatures is something that we can come up with relatively easily. If I jump back into my saturation tables by temperature and find 68 and 90, I mean I still have to interpolate for the UF value at 68 degrees, and just in the interest of comparing the amount of time spent here, let's recompute that again. So I'm saying this is 68 minus 65 divided by 70 minus 65, and we're calling that about the same as x minus 272.02 divided by 292.95 minus 272.02 and we get a UF value of 68 degrees Celsius of 284.578 and for the value at 90 we don't have to interpolate we can just look at it and we see that it is 376.85 376.85 Now let's calculate a delta U. That would be U2, which is 2, excuse me, 376.85 minus 284.578. And we get 92.272. So just for comparison here, we did one interpolation instead of what? Like 8? And we got a number that was within... 0 0.005 kilojoules per kilogram. Do you think that's acceptable error? I mean, let's actually try computing that, shall we? That would be 92.272 minus 92.277 divided by 92.277. We have introduced an error of 0.005%. I would argue that that uncertainty is within and the uncertainty that we had in this result in the first place because we performed a bunch of interpolations all of them were linear interpolations and we assumed a pressure don't forget that 
that assumption of pressure is going to have a huge result on our result. If we were trying to increase the temperature of water in Colorado, where the ambient pressure is going to be much lower than sea level, or if we were looking at a situation like Amsterdam, where perhaps it's higher than sea level, that pressure is going to have a result on our answer. So we can't even be that confident in this answer being the correct one. The correct one being in heavy quotation marks there, because we can only be as confident in our answer as we are about the information that we have in order to be able to build it. That's why it's so important to list your assumptions when you're working through these problems. Anyway, we incurred just a tiny bit of error in order to have an answer in two minutes instead of 20 minutes. I would argue that that's acceptable error. But wait, we're not done. Let's go another step further. <laughs> Let's look at how internal energy varies as a function of temperature. If I were to plot that out to scale, which I have done for you, we can see that the internal energy of water, plotted as a function of temperature, looks like this. So where are we on this plot? Oh, we're, we're way down here. We're talking about a difference in internal energy between this temperature and this temperature. Now, what observation can you make about that relationship? It looks very nearly linear, right? So one of the assumptions that we can make when we are talking about approximating this result is that that relationship is, in fact, linear. And in order to be able to describe that a little bit better, let's introduce a concept. And that concept is heat capacity. When we are talking about heat capacity, what we are describing is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of a substance by one degree. And just like how we describe specific internal energy and specific enthalpy a little bit more usefully than total internal energy and total enthalpy, it is often more convenient for us to describe a specific heat capacity. And specific heat capacity is heat capacity divided by mass, which is the energy required to raise the temperature of a unit mass of the substance by one degree. And the variable we use to abbreviate heat capacity is C. So if I were to start a table here, I can say heat capacity can describe a couple of different things for liquids. And I should add that this is incompressible. Liquids and solids. And the way that we define heat capacity for incompressible liquids and solids is with the derivative of internal energy with respect to temperature. And when it's an uppercase value like this, that's total heat capacity, is the derivative of total internal energy with respect to temperature. And specific heat capacity, which would be a lowercase c, would be the derivative of specific internal energy with respect to temperature. Again, uppercase is total heat capacity, which we almost never use. Lowercase c is specific heat capacity, which we are going to use all the time. And the reason it is so useful is because we can describe del u as c del t. So if we were able to integrate, we could determine a delta u. That delta u would be the integral of c as a function of temperature with respect to temperature. So option two on our list of shortcuts, which is also option two on our list of options, would be to determine how the specific heat capacity varies as a function of temperature and integrate. There are lines of best fit based on empirical data out there for a lot of different substances. You can approximate the specific heat capacity at any temperature by connecting dots that we've established based on recordings of how the temperature changes as you are adding or decreasing energy. 
But it gets even better if we assume specific heat capacity is not a function of temperature. At which point it comes out of the integral. So if I jump back to this plot of internal energy and temperature for water, we see that that relationship, especially in the liquid region, I mean, here, let me zoom in on that liquid region. That relationship is perhaps a slight curve. I mean, maybe the slope of that line is a function of temperature, but I would argue that it probably is close enough to being a line that we could get away with calling it a line in most circumstances. So if we assume, if we assume the specific heat capacity is not a function of temperature, or we could say if we assume specific heat capacity is constant, then it comes out of the integral, at which point I just have the integral of LU is equal to C times the integral of del T. But delta U is equal to C delta T. And the specific heat capacity for a substance can be looked up. Where do we look it up, you ask? Where do we look up anything? In our tables. In our tables, specifically, if we jump over to table A19, we can see the specific heat capacity that would be indicated here as a CP instead of just a C for reasons that will make a little bit more sense later on. Specific heat capacity here for a variety of substances, including but not limited to water at different temperatures is going to be, oh, I don't know, 4.211 or 4.179 or 4.182. They do change as a function of temperature, but not by much. If we're willing to accept a little bit of error, we could assume that it's constant. It doesn't change as a function of temperature and just multiply this number by our delta D. Now the question becomes, which value do we use? The best thing to do here would be to use the value that is closest to halfway between our temperatures. So halfway between 68 and 90 is going to be 79, right? So 79 degrees Celsius plus 273.15 is 352.15. So yeah, we could interpolate between 4.195 and 4.22, but why? We are already approximating. It would be pointless for us to try to be that precise about our approximation. Does that make sense? We are incurring the error, the uncertainty, by assuming that it doesn't change as a function of temperature. So using 4.1955 instead of 4.195 is probably going to be unnecessary precision. Like we're already approximating, we might as well approximate. If we wanted to be precise, we would be precise. Anyway, so then if I'm using 4.195 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, and I multiply by a temperature difference in Kelvin, which would be 90 minus 68, I get 92.29. Now, we got in our previous iterations 92.277 and 92.272. So again, let's calculate a percent error here, 92.29 minus 92.277 divided by 92.277. Do you think that's close enough? And the answer is yeah, it is. For this circumstance, it's probably just fine because we weren't that confident in this number anyway. The circumstances of the problem are going to be what you use to infer how important precision is. For now, for our exams, I will probably hint very heavy handedly what direction I'm looking for you to go in. In the real world, it would depend on the circumstances of your problem. What is your safety factor? How precise do you need to be in this calculation? 
What other things are you assuming and how much error are you incurring by making those assumptions? Anyway, so assuming heat capacity is constant is our third option for evaluating delta U and delta H. For our purposes in this class, we are only going to be using options one or three. We are not going to be using option two at all. And that's because we don't have good data for how specific heat capacity of water changes as a function of temperature other than just using these data points and trying to connect them. So if we're going to approximate, we're going to approximate. And if we're going to not approximate, we are going to try to not approximate. Those are our two directions. Does that make sense? So for our purposes, I'm only expecting you to use options one and three. And which one is better or worse in which circumstances is something that you'll get the hang of. The only hard and fast rules that you need to know are option three becomes less accurate the further apart your temperatures are, and you can never evaluate delta U or delta H using option three across a phase change because doing so neglects the latent energy associated with that phase change. I mean, if I jump back to this plot here, this vertical distance right here. That's the latent energy associated with going from liquid water to vapor water. That latent energy would be neglected if you looked up the slope of this line and then used this temperature difference between here and here. Right? Because it would just, it would tell you this vertical distance was your change in internal energy and you would neglect this huge latent energy associated with the change in phase. Also, while we're here, let me just point out Look at how much bigger the latent energy is going from liquid to vapor than the sensible energy to go from 0 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. That energy required to take liquid water at a constant pressure from 0 degrees Celsius to its boiling point, its freezing point all the way to its boiling point, is what, like a fifth of the energy required to change the phase once it gets to the boiling point? That's why when you put water on the stove and you bring it to a boil, it takes way longer to actually all boil than it does to get to boiling in the first place. It's because of the fact that this is so much bigger than that sensible energy change. Anyway, those hard and fast rules are all you need to know for now. You'll get the hang of whether or not to assume constant specific heats based on the circumstances as we go forward. Before we go forward, though, let me pad out our definitions of our specific heat capacity a little bit more. For incompressible liquids and solids, there is only one heat capacity. It is C, and the book calls it Cp. And again, the reason for that will make a little bit more sense in just a second here. When we are talking about substances, solids and liquids do not make up all of the substances that we analyze. Instead, we have to also define a value for gases. And for gases, we do not just use one specific heat capacity, we use two. A heat capacity at a constant pressure and a heat capacity at a constant volume. And the reason that we use those two values is to establish kind of a border case. I mean, if you imagine that you were heating up a rigid container The amount of energy it would take to increase the energy of this rigid container would be delta U because it's at a constant volume. Now, if you compare that to the amount of energy it would take to heat up a piston cylinder arrangement that was allowed to move up and down in order to keep the pressure constant, the heat coming in would go into the delta U, but it would also go into the boundary work. And if we defined the boundary work as the boundary work of an isobaric process, then the boundary work in this particular instance would be pressure times change in volume. So if we added together the total change in internal energy plus pressure times change in volume, then we would end up with change in total enthalpy. And if we were describing the specific heat capacity associated with that, then we would need to describe that on a specific basis. Therefore, the relevant parameter would be specific enthalpy. Does that make sense? 
when you are heating up a process with a constant volume, all of your energy goes into delta U, or more of your energy goes into delta U. Whereas if you are heating up a process at a constant pressure, some of the energy goes into the delta U, some of it goes into boundary work. So it appears to take more energy to increase the temperature because you're not getting all of a return on your investment. Does that make sense? These are the two border cases we established. One for internal energy, one for a change in enthalpy. And those are based on analyzing a constant volume process and a constant pressure process. And that's why we add this P and V to indicate that we are analyzing a constant pressure process and a constant volume process. So the specific heat capacity for constant pressure is defined as the partial derivative of specific enthalpy with respect to temperature, but only when the pressure is constant. And the specific heat capacity for constant volume is defined as the partial derivative of internal energy with respect to temperature, but only when the volume is constant. That's gases. And specifically, that's real gases. If we make the simplification for ideal gases, this gets a little bit easier yet. That's based on the fact that for an ideal gas, We say internal energy is only a function of temperature. Pressure doesn't affect it. It is only a function of temperature. There is empirical data to reinforce that. But for now, we're just saying that specific internal energy is only a function of temperature. And because for an ideal gas, specific enthalpy is specific internal energy plus pressure times specific volume. And we can make the substitution that pressure times specific volume is equal to R times T because of the ideal gas law. Pressure times total volume is equal to mass times specific gas constant times temperature, which we could write as pressure times specific volume, because we're replacing volume over mass with specific volume, is equal to specific gas constant times temperature. Now, all of a sudden, we have a function of temperature, we have a constant, and we have a function of temperature. Therefore, specific enthalpy is also only a function of temperature. So for ideal gases, specific internal energy and specific enthalpy are only functions of temperature. As a side note, you may have noticed that in your property tables, you have properties for ideal air in the same way that you have properties for water. But this table is much more straightforward. There's only temperature. The reason that you are looking up specific enthalpy and specific internal energy as a function of temperature is because they're only functions of temperature. You don't have to worry about what the pressure is. There's no pressure subtables. We're not splitting it into different phases. It's just ideal gas is specific enthalpy and specific internal energy is a function of temperature. Anyway. Because specific enthalpy and specific internal energy are only functions of temperature then, for ideal gases specifically, this requirement is not necessary. And this changes from a partial derivative to a regular derivative. So it doesn't matter if the pressure is constant or if the volume is constant. Cp and Cv have to do with enthalpy or temperature. Again, for an ideal gas, Cp is defined as dH dt, Cv is defined as du dt. So if you're in a situation with an ideal gas where you have assumed constant specific heats and you need to substitute Cp delta t or Cv delta t, which one you use is not dependent on if you have a volume or pressure that is constant. It is dependent entirely on if you have a delta H or a delta U. Right somewhere into your brain, H goes to P, U goes to V. The way that I would encourage that is by remembering Harry Potter and ultraviolet. H goes to P, U goes to V. These are our definitions of specific heat capacity. 
depending on what our phase is, and if we've assumed that a gas is ideal or not, we may be able to use two different specific heat capacities, and they might just be a function of temperature, or we might just have one specific heat capacity to rule them all.